pleasant it is this morning to, to gather as your children to offer up our praise and worship to you. We ask that you'll draw near to us, that our hearts are open, that our minds are open to hear, to hear your word, to hear your voice, to hear the conviction in our life that it has. We know that you've lifted us up out of that pit and placed our feet on a firm foundation. I pray that you'll keep us from backsliding, keep us from falling. Father, we ask that you'll open up our minds and our hearts to, to know you, to draw near to you. And we pray that we honor and glorify your name this morning. For it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Did you see that you can see everybody this morning? Beautiful fall. I guess it's fall now. I think somebody said it was fall. A couple announcements. We'll get back, back to our worship service, our Bible study, as we're going through Genesis. Uh, this Wednesday at 7 o'clock, we invite everybody to come for that. If you miss it, you can catch the links on our Facebook page or on our website in order if you want to keep up with what we're studying through Genesis. Uh, we had our barbecue yesterday, so thanks to everybody who came out and participated. I don't know, I was wiped out by the time I got home, but it was a great day. Thank you for everybody that, that helped, that came and, and helped serve last night. Um, it was a blessing. We, we served well over 200 meals, though. And we, when we take Fredonia in consideration, 2,000 people, that's 10% of the population of, of the city that we fed last night. So it was a blessing. Um, we can see that the, it was a blessing on several of the people's faces that were able to come and, and enjoy a, a, a free meal. So all the work that went into it, it was, it was sure worth it. And we're thankful for everybody who, who came and, and helped with that last night. Our men's breakfast next week, um, at next Saturday at, at 8 o'clock. It'll be at Tom's house this week, so Tom will be hosting that. So. Uh, if you come here, you'll you'll be lonely out in the parking lot by yourself. Uh, so come to Tom's and don't remember that after we eat, we're going to come back here to the church. Um, we have a couple, a little bit of work that we're going to do outside, uh, pulling up some stumps and that, that little planter that we have out there. So shouldn't take that long. We're not going to take your whole day. It's just a couple of hours of, um, of work next week. So we're going to feed you well, big breakfast, a um, little bit of work. So good, good, good trade off. Uh, our fellowship lunch is uh, next week. So we'll, we'll have communion during our regular service and then we'll meet or we'll stay afterwards and, and have a time of, of eating and fellowship. Um, the, the menu's back there on the, on the back table. I, it looked like it was already filled up. So uh, we have chicken and noodle dinner and all the, all the things that go along with it. So if you haven't signed up, um, if, you, if you don't find a space that's empty, uh, think what else that needs to be brought and just uh, write it down and, and put your name on it. But uh, next week, just uh, plan on eating lunch here at the church afterwards. That's all we got. Let's come back for you. Wait. Um, this is the final week for any of the women that are going to go on the women's uh, thing. And I need to know who all is going. And I need to get with you guys. If you guys can get with me because I need to know if it's your wife's pedicures or what. So I can confirm that with her today. <laughs> Did y'all hear that? <laughs> the ladies day out. Um, confirmed with Renee.
Joe, would you lead us in prayer this morning? Father, we thank you for this beautiful morning. Blessings, Lord, we just pray that you would use this offering uh, this morning to your services. We can thank you for each one that's here and, and uh, pray for the ones that took makeup this morning, Lord, that you would give them in. Have your Bible to Luke chapter 5. We'll be looking at verses 27 through 32 this morning. So, a couple of weeks ago, Jesus called his first disciples with Peter, John, and James. And then, when we take into account Mark's gospel, he tells us that Andrew, Peter's brother, was there as well. And Jesus was teaching right off of the shore on Peter's boat. And then he turns to Peter and tells them to pull away from shore a little bit further and to let down their nets. And after a little bit of grumbling, Peter does so. And then we see that they catch this great multitude of fish to where their boats nearly sink. A fisherman's dream. This is a kind of catch that would have been financially beneficial to all of their families. In the midst of all the excitement, Peter falls at the feet of Jesus and declares himself a sinner. A sinner that's so great that Jesus needs to leave his presence immediately. Because in the Jewish tradition, especially those who lean towards the Pharisaical law and the way of things, that even being in the same company of a sinner defiled the righteous. So Peter says, depart from me, O Lord, for I am a sinful man. But Jesus does not depart. Instead, he tells Peter to not be afraid. From now on, I will make you a fisher of men. And we see, just like the leper, that the unclean Peter did not defile Jesus and make Jesus unclean. Jesus made Peter clean. And when they brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed Jesus. We have Peter, Andrew, John, and James. These four men who were partners, they owned and operated a fishing business together. They had boats and nets and equipment, and they had the catch of a lifetime. And when they get to shore, they leave everything behind. In Mark's gospel, when he tells us that when Jesus calls John and James, that they even leave their father in the boat behind. They left everything behind to follow Jesus. They left possessions. They left the safety of their homes and family, the security of income to leave everything behind, including income. If I don't can't have income, then how can I do this? How can I take care of my family if there's nothing coming in? Jesus told Peter, don't be afraid. It means to stop being afraid. Don't be afraid to follow me when I call you to follow me. So they leave everything behind and follow him. We see that the cost of discipleship is high. And in today's modern day progressive church, the health and wealth and prosperity gospel, they teach what's contradictory to what we're being taught here. And that's why the church is so popular, because when they call you to come, it doesn't cost you anything. The cost of discipleship is nothing. There's no mention of sin or the need for repentance. 
Instead, it's the, quite the opposite. Just come, and instead of it costing you anything, you're going to gain everything. If you just believe enough, if you pray enough, if you have enough faith, and of course, if you give enough, it's always surrounded by your giving enough. Then you'll have everything added to you. You'll have health and wealth and prosperity. This contradicts everything that we're taught in the New Testament. The cost of discipleship is high. It's going to cost you something. Over the last 20 years, the evangelical church has been in steady decline. People are leaving the church in droves. Attendance is down, baptism is down, all across the board except for one. One small faction in the church. If you lose, use that term very loosely, quote unquote, the church, there's only one small faction that's in incline. And that's the health and wealth and prosperity in the ultra charismatic movement. So we ask our question how come everybody else is in decline and this one area of the quote unquote church is on the incline? It's because the cost of discipleship costs them nothing. And that's what people attract. They want religion without nothing. They want salvation without the need for forgiveness. They want eternal life without the need of sanctification. That's what attracts people. We want what Christian, what the Christian Bible offers, eternal life, without it costing us anything. That's why the church is so attractive. If all we do is, if all it's going to do is just cost me a little bit of extra money, people are willing to throw a little extra money at it, if that means that I'll get everything that the Bible promises. That's not what the Bible teaches us. It teaches us that the cost of discipleship is high. It's going to cost you something. And there are certain things that you might have to leave behind. And in some instances, those things are the things that have provided from you in the past. For some to leave everything behind, just like we see today in our text that we're going to read this morning, when it says they left everything behind, it literally meant that they got up and left everything behind. Jesus tells us that we cannot serve two masters. But each one of us here, myself included, think we know better than Jesus. We, we've got it figured out. It hasn't been figured out in 10,000 years, but we've got it figured out to where we can have the whole world and keep our soul. But that's not what Jesus teaches us. We cannot serve two masters. To be his follower demands complete loyalty, obedience, and submission to him. He is either Lord over all of your life, or he is not Lord at all in your life. That's what the word Lord means. He's the Lord over everything. The music that you listen to, what you choose to watch on TV, whatever it's rated, RX, triple X. Is that what you've separated out of your life? He's not the Lord of that part of my life. That's what I keep separate. He is either Lord over all, or he is not your Lord at all. And we'll see it again this morning in his call to another disciple that it costs everything to come and follow me, as Jesus says. Luke chapter 5, verses 27 to 32. After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. He said to him, follow me, and leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his house, and there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. Everything that's happened in the last couple of sections as we're going through Luke's gospel has happened in and around the Sea of Galilee in the city of Capernaum. So we can assume that this is where this is taking place as well. We run into this tax collector named Levi. So in over in chapter 6, when Luke gives the names of all the 12 disciples, we see that Levi is not mentioned, but instead Matthew. So this Levi here is who we know as Matthew. 
the same Matthew who would later go on and write the gospel of Matthew. And in Matthew chapter 9, in his gospel, Matthew says that this is him, that this is happening to. In Matthew 9, 9, as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at his tax booth, and he said to him, follow me, and he rose and followed him. That's Matthew 9, 9. So this is Matthew who we're talking about today. So we'll just refer to him as Matthew from here on out, so it's not to confuse anyone. We're all familiar with Matthew. The same Matthew who would later on write the Gospel of Matthew, we see that he is a tax collector. A tax collector during this time would have been have one of the most hated people among the Jews. They were ostracized by the community. They were considered dishonest and immoral. They were viewed as crooked because they were, they were crooks. They were Jews appointed by the Roman government in order to collect taxes on their behalf. In order to get this job, you had to bid for it. It went to the highest bidder. So this is the way that the job worked. When the tax collector went to tax, collect these taxes, they had to collect what the Romans already wanted. So then they had to go back and collect more in order for them to make their money back. They had to bid for the job. So in order to break even, they had to collect even more taxes. And then to make any money, they needed to go back and collect even more taxes. They were professional extortionists. They worked for the hated Romans and they made their money off taxing their own people, the Jews. And being a tax collector by the Sea of Galilee in and around the city of Capernaum, we can be pretty certain that Peter, Andrew, John, and James all knew Matthew. Not only knew him, they hated Matthew. He would have taken large sums of money from each one of these men who operated their fishing business together. He would have taken food off their tables, maybe to the point that they went without, that their wives and their children went without for days on end because of Matthew's greed and continually extorting money from each one of them. They would have hated this man. When they were walking down the street and they saw Matthew there sitting at his tax booth, I'm sure it made their blood boil. Each one of them was probably thinking, I wish I could just get my hands around this man's neck. If somebody would give me 30 seconds in a dark alley with this guy, I wouldn't get my money back, but I'd sure feel a little bit better about my afterwards. So as they're walking by Matthew's tax booth and Jesus calls out to him, and maybe they wanted Jesus to say something to him. This guy who cheats his own people, who is wicked, he doesn't adhere to the law of Moses. He's not a worshiper. Maybe Jesus should rebuke him for his wickedness. How dare this man commit such shameful acts against his own people? And Jesus calls out to him, follow me. There are times, I like history. There are some times in history where I'm reading history or learning about history. And in this particular case, biblical history, where you wish were you just a fly on the wall in order to witness the event that's taking place. I wish I could have seen the reaction the look on the face of Peter and Andrew and John and James when Jesus calls Matthew to come be a part of their group. With no exaggeration, this is the guy that they probably hated most in the world. And Jesus just brought him in to be part of the circle. Talk about an awkward situation as Matthew walks over to be among them. Jesus calls to him, follow me. And the text says that in leaving everything, he rose and followed him. Again, we have a disciple who's called and who leaves everything behind. The word there for leave everything, it means to leave behind in totality. Peter and the other guys, they left their fishing business behind. 
If it doesn't work out with this Jesus guy, they can always go back and pick up where they left off, fishing. When Matthew left everything behind, there's no going back for Matthew. He turned his back on the Roman government. He turned his back on Herod Antipas, who he was collecting taxes for up and around Galilee. He abandoned his tax booth. So when he leaves, there's no way that he can go and get his job back. And no one else is going to hire this guy after what he's done. If he's left starving in the street, nobody's going to feel sorry for Matthew. When Matthew leaves everything behind, that's exactly what it meant. Because the cost of discipleship will cost us everything. We must leave this world behind when we become followers of Christ. So what else does it cost us? Besides everything we leave behind. Well, let's set aside Matthew for a second and go back to Peter and Andrew and John and James. They've already left everything behind to follow Jesus. They've paid the cost. They've left their business, the world behind. But I bet they had no idea that they were not finished paying the cost. Because when Jesus called Matthew, it cost them so much more than they anticipated. When Jesus first called them, it required them to leave worldly possessions and relationships behind. But when Jesus called Matthew, it now required them to forgive the one person that they could not forgive. The cost of discipleship is high. It will cost you your ego. It's going to cost you your own self-importance, your own self-righteousness. It's going to cost you all the hate and grudges that you hold against people in this life. When we look over at Matthew, again, this same Matthew that we're talking about this morning in his gospel, Matthew chapter 6, Matthew 5 through 7 is the Sermon on the Mount, directly in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 6, we get the Lord's Prayer. Immediately after the Lord's Prayer there in verse 14, right, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Verse 14, immediately after, Jesus says, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. It's conditional. If you're asking God to forgive you of the things that you've committed against him, then it requires you, in turn, to forgive those who have sinned against you. But this is Matthew's gospel. Everybody hated Matthew, so it's easy for Matthew to put that in his gospel. That, hey, if you want God's forgiveness, you need to forgive people that you really hate. And Matthew knew that because people really hated him. Back over in Luke, We'll see it in Luke chapter 6. We'll get to it in a few weeks. In Luke 6, verse 27 and 28, Jesus speaking again. But I say to you who hear, you have ears, let him hear. Who has ears? Everybody. Jesus said, everybody, listen up. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. That's asking a lot, isn't it? Jesus asked the impossible out of us. He's speaking to people who hate other people. The Jews hated the Samaritans. They hated the Gentiles. So Jesus has said, you know what you need to do with those people that you hate? Love them instead. This is radical Christianity. This would have been revolutionary in the day that Jesus is saying these things. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray to those, pray for those who abuse you. Jesus asked us to do difficult things in order to be his follower. We have to forgive just as our Heavenly Father has forgiven us. We turn over to Colossians just to see what Paul's perspective. Maybe Paul had a different perspective. 
Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 12. In Colossians 3, verses 1 through 11, Paul is saying, since you've been raised with Christ, if you're a born-again believer, if you call yourself a child of God, then he says these are the things that you need to take off. You need to turn away from and do away with in verses 1 through 11. And those things have to do with obscene talk, <coughs> anger, malice, wrath, that's hate. The hate that you have for others. Paul says you need to take these things off if you're going to be a follower of Christ. And then when we get to verse 12, he begins to tell us now the things that we must put on as God's chosen one. If you are God's chosen one, if you are his holy and beloved, Paul says all those things that you've done away with, that you've turned your back on, now must be replaced with these. Compassionate heart, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. It requires forgiveness to those who we cannot forgive. Above all these, Paul says, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. It binds everything. Love is the glue that binds everything together. Love is the glue that keeps the church together. Jesus says, you will know my disciples by this, that they have love for one another. And when you do that, Paul says in verse 15, then let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful that when you take off the things in verses 1 through 11, and you put on these things beginning in verse 12, that's the only time that you're ever going to find peace, real peace in this life. Let the peace of Christ, it says, to rule in your hearts. He takes rulership. It's his peace that's rulership over your heart. That's the only time you're going to find peace. It's not only when God forgives you, but in return when you forgive others. Otherwise, you'll have no real peace in this life. And even further, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. To dwell, that means to live in, take up permanent residence. Let the word of Christ take up permanent residence in your lives. The only way that the word of Christ is going to dwell in you richly is if you put it there. If you're all week, if you go home and your Bibles look like this, the word of Christ is not going to dwell in you. They must look like this, and you have to be in them and reading them. Otherwise, the word of Christ will not dwell in you richly. This is the cost of our discipleship. We must forgive in the same way that the Lord has forgiven us. And with calling to Peter that we've seen a couple of weeks ago, and then this morning, this calling of Matthew, we can almost see the Lord's prayer coming together in there. Because first, Peter comes to Jesus and admits that he's a sinner. We know that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So as Peter says, Lord, forgive us our sins, and now Matthew is introduced into the group. So now Peter, among all these people, knows exactly what it means to say, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Nobody knew it more than Peter and his other guys that are standing there as Matthew is being brought into the group. In order to receive forgiveness, we must have a heart of forgiveness. Jesus said to follow me and leave everything. And Matthew rose and followed him. He left his booth. He left his cash register, his ledger, his lucrative business, and followed Christ. There was no going back for Matthew. This is Christian discipleship. You follow Christ. And sometimes that means all the way to the cross. The cost of discipleship is high. 
We see it over in chapter 9 in Luke. Verses 23 to 25. He said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. We don't take up that cross that one time. The day that we were saved or the day that we were baptized, we put on that cross and then we forget about it. Jesus says you have to pick up that cross each and every day. Knowing the weight of it. Knowing that one day you might be crucified upon it yourself for being his follower. The cost of discipleship is high. Verses 29 and 30. Levi made a great feast in his house. There was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with them. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? So Matthew follows Jesus, and the first thing he does is he throws a little party. He throws this huge banquet because a man who's been called to discipleship by Jesus can't wait to invite all his friends. He invites all his friends so that they too might encounter this Jesus. J.C. Ryle he said, a converted man will not wish to go to heaven alone. That's what it should be like for each one of us. That when we've experienced forgiveness and salvation, that we don't wish to go alone, that we can't go wait and tell everyone else so they too might join us in eternity. Again, another fly on the wall situation. Peter and all the rest of the fellows here are now going to their hated enemy's house for dinner. And wouldn't you know it, the house is full of more tax collectors. A house full of misfits. We see here that the Pharisees called them tax collectors and sinners. So whoever these other people were, they were viewed, at least in the eyes of the Pharisees, as sinners. This kind of reminds us a little bit of another banquet that Jesus speaks of later. He, used, he loved to use this metaphor of the banquet over in chapter 14 of Luke. He gives us a little parable of the banquet, Luke 14, 12. He said also to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. When you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. You will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. So Jesus says, if you do something, do something for somebody who can't pay you in return. Thus you're storing up treasure in heaven. And then he mentions the resurrection. The resurrection of the just you'll be repaid then your storage your you're building up treasure in heaven and then we see one guy who's reclining at the table with him speaks up and says blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of god so at least we know this man that's sitting at the table he had some kind of theology of the end day resurrection even though it was misplaced because he's including himself in that last day of resurrection. Blessed is everyone who's going to eat bread in the kingdom of God. He assumed he was going to be there just because of his own position, his own self-righteousness. We later learn in Revelation 19, as the apostle John tells us of another great, great banquet, as he has a vision of the marriage supper of the Lamb, which is going to be the greatest banquet that's ever been in Revelation 19, verse 6 through 9. John is having a vision of what will take place when Christ returns for us. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah. 
For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For Christ is the bridegroom, his church, his remnant is the bride. For the linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. The angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. So we see that there will be a great banquet and blessed are those who are invited to that banquet. So when Jesus tells a parable of the great banquet, he's telling it with Revelation 19 in his own mind. Because look at who's invited to this banquet. Not the guy at the beginning who assumes he's going to be there. No, there's going to be people there that he has no assumption that's going to be there at all. It's not who you think. Your own self-interest, your own self-righteousness is not going to earn you a seat at that table. So Jesus, after this man says, Blessed is everyone who's going to eat bread in the kingdom of God. Jesus took that as an opportunity to tell him, Let me tell you who's going to be there. A man once craved a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servants to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything's now ready. But they all began to make excuses. The first said to him, I bought a field. I have to go out and see it. Please have me excused. Another said, I bought five oak of oxen. I'll go examine them. Please have me excused. Another said, I have a married wife. Therefore, I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Now go quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. And the servant said, Sir, what, are, what you've commanded has been done. There's still room. And the master said, Go out into the highways and the hedges and compel people to come in that my house might be filled. For I tell you, none of those who were invited shall taste my banquet. So all these people that Jesus is now listing, the blind, the lame, the crippled, they were viewed against the religious elite as those who were unclean. Or they had some, they had these diseases and these infirmities because they were sinners. Therefore, they could not go to this banquet because they were outside the kingdom of God. Yet Jesus shows them that it's not those who think that they're going in their own self-righteousness but it is the sinners that he calls to righteousness. So we take that all into consideration in context as we go back to Luke chapter 5 and this little banquet that Matthew is now throwing for Jesus. Especially when we put it in contrast with the Pharisees and the tax collectors, which was one that Luke used quite a bit because Jesus used that contrast quite a bit the Pharisee and the tax collector blessed are you if you're invited to the great marriage supper of the Lamb by the way that table will probably be filled with people that you don't like either in fact there might be a couple of people who end up there that you hate and in your eyes you don't think that they belong there just as Peter and Andrew, John and James had to go sit at the banquet table with Matthew, you might have to sit at Jesus' table with somebody that you didn't get along with and someone that you didn't agree with. That's why the cost of that invitation to that banquet is a high cost. Because you must leave everything behind. You must love your enemies. You must do good to those who hate you and forgive those who have sinned against you. The cost of discipleship is high. The Pharisees come, they begin to grumble to the disciples. They're not quite ready to go take their complaints directly to Jesus, so instead they complain to his disciples. And this is the first time that that word disciple is used here in Luke's gospel, the Greek word methetes. It means a follower, a pupil, a student. We all understand that as a disciple, it probably means follower, but it literally means a student of someone. And in this day and age, in first century Israel, a student would follow the teacher or their rabbi around everywhere that he went. They would intently listen 
to everything he had to say. They didn't have tablets. They had to memorize everything their teacher said. They would study his characteristics, his mannerisms, the way he acted, the way he walked, and the way he talked. And when they graduated to the point to the where the teacher sent them away, they would then go back to their hometowns or wherever they went, and they would imitate their teacher. That's what it means to be a disciple, to learn everything that our teacher has taught us, and then when we go out is to be a complete imitation of him to the world. The Pharisees believed that mingling with such people caused ritual and moral uncleanliness. So what was their solution? Their solution was just don't associate with sinners at all. These are the religious leaders of their day. They thought it was best just to leave sinners exactly where they found them, away in their sin. And as a church, if we're not careful, we can become Pharisees. That we get so comfortable about where we're at, and we're comfortable enough with the people that are in this room, that we no longer consider the other people who are out in the centers of this city. We come to church for worship. Evangelism takes place outside these walls. So they pose the question, not to Jesus, but to his disciples. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Right, that you there is in the plural, you all, including Jesus. Why do you all eat with tax collectors and sinners? Perhaps some of his disciples were wondering the same thing. I hate this guy. He's extorted thousands of dollars from me over the years. And now I'm at his house and I'm eating with him. And his house is full of other tax collectors and undesirable people. It's full of sinners. They're probably thinking to themselves, why are we here? The question's posed to the disciples, but Jesus answers it. Because they probably didn't even know how to answer that question. Why are you eating with tax collectors and sinners? And then Jesus answers the question in verse 31 and 32. And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. It's not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. And just as a doctor has a calling to the sick, Jesus has a calling to the sinner. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And there's probably a little hint of sarcasm in this statement. Maybe not a hint, it might be dripping with sarcasm. Because we all know that we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We know that there are none righteous, no, not one. So then, of course, Jesus is not called the righteous because there are none. And he said this in light of those who are asking the question in the first place, the Pharisees, who were self-righteous. They took the law and they made it even stricter than what God had made it. And then by doing so, they believed that they were even more righteous than those who did it. And they were critical of others who didn't follow their way of teaching. Jesus said, I've come to call sinners to repentance. And repentance is not easy for the self-righteous. In fact, it's impossible. And there lies the sarcasm. In order to repent, one must first acknowledge themselves as a sinner. And that's something that a Pharisee would never do. They would never acknowledge that they are a sinner. And John teaches us in 1 John that if you say that you are without sin, then you're a liar and there is no truth in you. Because repentance is a prerequisite for forgiveness. Therefore, in Jesus' eyes, it didn't matter if you were a tax collector or a Pharisee because they were both in need of the same thing. Jesus came to call both the tax collector and the Pharisee to repentance. Over in Luke chapter 18, Jesus gives us a parable of who? The Pharisee and the tax collector. The one man who was self-righteous and the other guy who was viewed as a wretched sinner. 
Matthew 18, verses, beginning in verse 9. He also told this parable to listen to, listen to how Luke described how he sets up this parable. He, speaking of Jesus, also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they treated others with contempt. He's speaking of the Pharisees. They trusted in themselves. They trusted in their own self-righteousness. And how do self-righteous people treat other people? They always treat other people with contempt. As though you are beneath them, they let, they rise themselves up in their own self-righteousness. So Jesus gives this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. That's how he describes himself. Thank God I'm not like other men. I'm not like other this tax collector. What's he saying? Thank God I'm not a what? A sinner. Thank God I'm not a sinner. And then he shows you his works. Because that's what self-righteous people will always do. They will always point you to their works. And their own self-righteousness will show you Look at all these things that I do. A person that's clothed in the righteousness of Christ will not point to their works. They will always point you back to the righteousness of Christ. But a self-righteous person will always point you back to their own works. I fast twice a week, which wasn't required. They were only required to fast one day a year on the Day of Atonement. But no, not once a year, twice, not twice a week. I'm the twice, twice a week kind of guy. And they were only required to give a tithe on their income. No, I tithe on the little parsley leaf that I grew in my kitchen last week. I cut a tenth off of that and tithed it to the church because I'm that kind of guy. This is the self-righteous Pharisee. Now Jesus turns to the tax collector. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift his eyes to heaven but be his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The irony of this, as Jesus is telling this parable, the tax collector is not allowed in the temple. He's been ostracized from the community. He's been cast out. He's not amongst. He's defiled and unclean. He would not be allowed to walk inside the temple. But just like the leper wasn't supposed to go inside the city, he did it anyway, because just like the leper, this tax collector needed Jesus. I know you can, just like the leper said to Jesus, but are you willing? And Jesus is always willing to those who come with a humble heart and ask for his mercy, because he's rich in mercy. He's abundant in grace. God, I know I'm a sinner. Have mercy on me. Forgive me. Show me grace. And Jesus says, I tell you, this man, the tax collector, went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. Those who humble themselves will be exalted. That word justified is a big word in the New Testament. That means not guilty before God. Jesus said the tax collector, not the Pharisee, the tax collector is righteous before God. Why? Because he came with a repentant heart, admitting himself a sinner and asking, for God's mercy. And just like the leper who asked, who says, I know you can, but are you willing? God is always willing to show mercy to the repentant heart. Just like in the Beatitudes, we covered, I don't know, probably a year and a half, two years ago when we went through the Beatitudes, the first Beatitude, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for those is the kingdom of heaven. 
You want to know what a foreign spirit is? This guy. This is the definition of what it means to be foreign spirit. I'm not even allowed to go into the temple, but I have to go because I've reached the point in my life that I'm so broken. I've come to the end of the rope. I have nowhere else to go except before God and call myself a sinner and throw myself at the mercy of him. That's what it means to be poor in spirit. God have mercy on me, a sinner. When Jesus calls you, he first calls you to repentance. He calls the sinner to repentance and then you leave that life of sin behind and follow him. The cost of discipleship is high, but the cost of not following Christ is much higher. The invitation to the marriage supper of the Lamb is of far greater value than anything that you'll ever gain in this world. Deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me is the command of Christ. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he was a German scholar and theologian during the time of Nazi Germany. He was subsequently executed because he was caught up in a plot to assassinate Hitler, but he was a tremendous scholar and theologian. In his book, which is titled The Cost of Discipleship, which I highly recommend, in fact, I probably have a copy in my office that anybody's welcome to read. In that book, Bonhoeffer says, when Christ calls a man, he bids him to come and die. That's what he's calling you to do. That's the cost of discipleship. To pick up that cross and follow him, that's what it means. And that's what it meant for every one of these disciples, except for John, who died a natural death. All the other disciples, and then we add Paul, we know Paul was beheaded. This disciple, Matthew, just got it from his tax booth. He was living a healthy and wealthy life. He was living his best life now, and he turned his back on that to go do what? Tradition tells us that he was killed by spears as an evangelist in Ethiopia. When he was called to follow Christ, that's where he followed him, all the way to a foreign land just to be cut up and killed by a spear. He left the comfort of home, the riches of his profession, because when Christ calls a man, he bids a man to come and die. That's the cost of discipleship. You must first die to self, and then if necessary, you might have to die upon that cross that you picked up and are currently carrying right now. We must forgive as God has forgiven us he says, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Ask yourself, are you a sinner who is in need of repentance right now? Like the tax collector, call upon God's mercy as a sinner, and he's willing to forgive you. Jesus bids you to come and follow him, an invitation to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Right? The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of eternal life. That's that invitation to the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's worth more than anything that this world could ever give you. Blessed are those who have one, the angel told John. There's room for you. There's room at the cross for you. There's room at that table on that marriage supper of the Lamb for you. All you have to do is deny yourself, repent, and believe the gospel. All you have to do is adhere to Jesus' words when he says to come and follow me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our time this morning. As we get into your word, we thank you for your son. As we all come before you as sinners in need of mercy, that your son paid the price for us that we might enter into the temple. We too were unclean and defiled, unworthy to come into your presence. But because of what your son has done for us on the cross, we can come confidently into your presence because you're rich in mercy. And with the great love in which you loved us, that even when we were dead in our trespass and sin, you made us alive together with Christ. And that's what we come each and every week to celebrate 
That's what we worship when we lift up our voices to you, to sing out from our hearts because of this great love and what you have for us. We pray that if there's none here today that have, has never come to you as this tax collector has come to you crying out for mercy, for the forgiveness of your sins, we pray that you open up their hearts, convict them of their sin where they sit at this very moment, that they might come to you. Father, we praise and honor and glorify your name, for it's in that name of Jesus we pray. Amen. If you're here and you've never come to Christ, we pray that today is that day of your salvation when he bids you to come and follow him. It's a high cost. We know what it cost him. It cost him his life. He was crucified. He who knew no sin was made to be sin. That's what it cost him. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. It cost him everything. And in return, when we are a follower of him, it cost us everything. We have to turn our backs on this world, the things of this world, the things that continually draw us away from them. We all know what they're, it's different for each one of us. We know what they are in our lives, the things that continually draw our hearts and minds away from him. Those that eventually you have to take a sword out and cut that string and get away from it. To be a follower, a disciple of him, is to be a learner of his, imitate him, know what he says, the most important thing. In order to have his word dwell in us richly, we have to put it there. By It's not going to be put there by osmosis with closed Bibles as we walk by it. Each and every day we have to open them and read it and get that word into our hearts. And as Paul says, that peace of Christ will dwell in us as well. It will rule our hearts. If you have any questions about salvation or baptism, I'd love to speak with you after service or we can set up a time to speak. Like you're ready to please, please rise. We're going to worship through songs one more time. Uh, I invite you again back Wednesday at 7 o'clock as we are going through the book of Genesis. If not, don't forget men's breakfast next Saturday. It's not here at the church. It's going to be at Tom's house at 8 o'clock. And we're going to come back and do a couple things around the church. If not, we'll see you back next Sunday at 9.30 for Sunday school or at 10.30 for worship.
ಈ ವಾಯ್ಡಸ್ಸು